Deutschland Erwache. The call of Germany awakened was Adolf Hitler's campaigning slogan in the 1930s. Hitler's promise to make Germany great again proved alluring to ordinary German voters. It was a promise he would fulfill by a massive expansion of her armed forces, which had been brutally restricted by the victorious allies at the end of World War I. Building on the Weimar government's clandestine expansion plans, Hitler cast aside the hated Versailles Treaty. By restoring German military capability, Hitler also restored her ability to wage aggressive war. It was a capability he intended to use to the full. Less than a generation after suffering humiliating defeat, the Wehrmacht was again on the offensive. The Versailles Treaty had been signed on the 28th of June, 1919. It was designed by the great powers to emasculate Germany. War reparations insisted on by France were crippling. The treaty so limited German power that her armed forces could not guarantee the integrity of her borders. As Germany was not even allowed to participate in the negotiations, the treaty was rejected at home as a dictated peace. The onerous terms ensured a foothold for anti-democratic forces, among which was a small right-wing group called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the Nazis. For a proud nation with a strong military tradition, the treaty was insulting. Germany was to be limited to a 100,000 strong army. The Navy was allowed to retain a few obsolete warships, which it could man with no more than 15,000 sailors. The Air Force and Naval Air Force were disbanded. The production and acquisition of heavy weapons such as tanks and aeroplanes were prohibited. From the outset, the Weimar government attempted to lessen the harshest terms. This revisionist policy had some little success, although an attempt to reduce the reparations in 1923 led to a brutal French occupation of the Ruhr, Germany's industrial heartland. Although avowedly socialist, the Weimar government embarked upon a policy of secretly expanding its forces. Even limited to 100,000 men, the post-war Reichswehr was a significant military weapon. All of its men were superbly trained career professionals, and they would form the nucleus of a later field army. The Reichswehr was composed of former members of the Imperial Army and Navy, and as such was highly anti-republican in nature. Hitler openly courted this significant power base. Within three days of achieving the chancellorship, he would announce plans to the Reichswehr generals for the re-arming of Germany, plans he would not reveal to the rest of the world for another two years. Nineteen thirty-five was the year that Hitler had the courage to take the rearmament metal in both hands. On the 8th of March, in one of his famous Saturday surprises, he announced that Germany had established an air force. So advanced had the secret preparations been that it numbered some 1,888 aircraft of all types, together with a personnel of 20,000. This served as a dry run for his next proclamation on the 16th of March. Germany was reinstating universal military service and the army would expand to half a million men in 36 divisions. It was a highly popular measure. To the cheers of thousands of spectators, Hitler held a review of the army along the Unter den Linden in Berlin. The arms build-up continued apace in the years that followed. By the beginning of 1939, army strength had reached 52 divisions, including five panzer or armor divisions. When Hitler ordered full war mobilization in August, that strength had doubled to more than 100 divisions. 
development of modern aircraft types had proceeded in parallel with the growth of the army. The result was that at the outbreak of war, the Luftwaffe enjoyed technical, if not numerical, superiority over potential opponents. It also enjoyed tactical superiority, thanks to a cadre of pilots with real combat experience gained in the Spanish Civil War. Only the Kriegsmarine lagged behind. Its rearmament plans needed much longer to come to fruition. The key to expansion was the German arms industry. Without the means to build the weapons, there would have been no rearmament. For most of this century, arms makers have depended on two main raw materials, coal and iron ore. Coal is the lifeblood of industry. It provides the power to run the factories. It provides the heat to fire the blast furnaces. And it is the iron ore which is converted into steel steel for use in cannon barrels and armor plate, in tanks and submarines. 80% of Germany's coal and steel industry was concentrated in the Ruhr Valley. Occupied by French troops in 1923, the Ruhr was vital to the economic life of the country. The French presence generated bitter hatred and a burning desire for revenge. It was a desire which would help Hitler's rise to power in no small measure. If coal and steel were the keys to the rebirth of Germany's armaments industry, then the key to that industry was Krupp. The Krupp family rose to prominence in the 19th century. Friedrich Krupp founded a cast steel plant in 1811, and under his son Alfred, known as the Cannon King, it became world famous. Alfred's son, Friedrich Alfred, saw the business expand dramatically, partly to meet demand from the rapidly growing German Navy, and partly from royalties on Krupp armor plate being paid by arms manufacturers all over the world. In 1900, Krupp employed more than 40,000 people. Krupp provided a large proportion of Germany's heavy armaments during World War I. But after the war, the company had to move out of the weapons business. Indeed, the Allies singled out Krupp in particular and ordered that its heavy weapons production lines be destroyed. The company survived, however, under the leadership of Gustav Krupp von Bolin und Halbach. Gustav von Bolin und Halbach married Bertha Krupp, heiress to the Krupp fortune, in 1906. Adding the Krupp family name to his own, he was appointed chairman in 1909. A neat, almost obsessively ordered man, he served on the Prussian State Council from 1921 to 1933. Forbidden to make weapons, Gustav Krupp ensured the survival of the company by diversifying. Within weeks of the armistice, he introduced a new company slogan, Wir machen alles, or We Make Everything. He converted the giant Krupp factories to the production of consumer goods, such as baby carriages and typewriters. The company was still permitted to produce and export steel, however, which was the foundation of any armaments industry. The firm remained in the heavy industrial business through the manufacture of railway engines and lorries. Starting from its first engine in 1919, Krupp had produced over 2,000 locomotives by the late 1930s. But Krupp was an arms business and with the secret assistance of the government and the army, it set about getting around the terms of the Versailles Treaty. In the 1920s, Krupp design teams were moved to Sweden and the Netherlands, where they continued to develop new weapons. By the late 1920s, Allied supervision of German industry had ceased, and it was safe for the design teams to return home. With the accession of Adolf Hitler to power, Krupp went back to making guns, and thanks to all of the preparatory work in the 1920s, it had advanced new weapons in production in an astonishingly short time. Diplomat, banker, and industrialist, Gustav had initially opposed Hitler and the Nazis, but on their achieving power, he became an enthusiast. Hitler lauded his company as a National Socialist model workplace and appointed him a military economy Führer in 1937. 
and the support of the Nazis was profitable. By the outbreak of World War II, Krupp controlled 87 major factories or industrial plants and 110 companies in Germany alone. The firm also had a controlling interest in more than 40 overseas concerns. Krupp was not the only industrial baron to support Hitler, although he was the most important. German industrialists played a major part in the rise of the Führer, not so much because they believed in his message, but rather because they saw the Nazis as a means of getting rid of the hated Weimar Republic. Although German industry was among the most powerful in Europe, it was organized into an almost feudal structure. Industrialists and their senior managers saw themselves as lords of the manor, demanding respect and obedience from their workers and treating them with paternalistic concern in return. The idealistic Weimar constitution threatened that way of life by promising workers the opportunity to earn a reasonable wage as a right rather than as a gift of the factory owners. Collective bargaining and compulsory arbitration in the case of disputes further alienated the big capitalists. And from the middle of the 1920s, they worked to return to the old ways, trying to reduce wages and benefits to the detriment of organized labor. Hitler began seriously to woo big business in 1931. And by 1932, he had started to win converts, in spite of the avowedly anti-capitalist stance of much of the Nazi leadership and party. Dressed in a dark business suit and playing the part of a right-wing conservative, he convinced a number of senior industrialists and bankers that the Nazis were the only force able to counter the fast-rising communists. He was not immediately successful, but he had sown the seeds on fertile ground. By the end of 1932, many of the most prominent of Germany's millionaires were working behind the scenes, urging on Hitler's chancellorship, and money was beginning to flow into the Nazi party's coffers. But if getting financial support was important, Hitler's wooing of the army was crucial. The German army's reputation survived its defeat in World War I. Many elements in German society were unreconciled to the loss of so much territory under the terms of the Versailles Treaty. The soldiers lamented the abolition of the monarchy and were, if not actively hostile, then at least coldly neutral towards the new republic. The army remained the one institution above party and potentially the final arbiter of German democracy. How the army emerged from its catastrophic defeat in 1918 is significant. It promoted the stab in the back legend, the claim that the army had not been beaten in the field, but betrayed by red treachery among the workers and pusillanimous leadership from the politicians. This overlooked the fact that the military high command had been in control of Germany since 1915 and only handed back the reins of power to a civilian administration once the front line caved in. Nevertheless, the army's interpretation of World War I found widespread acceptance and it became a central plank in Adolf Hitler's world view. The German political and economic situation today is extremely difficult. The Reichswehr publicly distanced itself from the Weimar Republic. General von Siecht refused to take part in Constitution Day and fought and won an argument to retain the imperial colors of black, white and red. He followed a trend observable even before the Kaiser's abdication in 1918 of transferring the army's loyalty from the person of the emperor to the fatherland, in effect, to the supreme command of the army. Nevertheless, when asked by President Ebert where the Reichswehr stood during the 1923 putsch attempt, Sieg's reply, behind me, was hardly reassuring. This process was only checked by the election of Field Marshal von Hindenburg to the presidency. Sieg retired in 1926. Three years later, Germany was in the grip of the Depression and the Nazis had become a national force to reckon with. The army was the one institution that could have stopped Hitler coming to power. Throughout its short life, the knowledge that the army could make or break a government had haunted the Weimar Republic. Even after 1933, the army could have removed Hitler before he began the war. And once the war was obviously lost, a military coup could have brought down the highly centralized Nazi regime in an afternoon.
resistance, according to so many of their post-war accounts. It was only Hitler's idiotic orders that prevented them winning the war, or at least making peace with the West. Why didn't the generals kill Hitler? Had Hitler attempted to seize power by another putsch, as he was urged to do by the SA throughout 1932, there is little doubt that the army would have shot down the brown shirts and probably their leader too. But Hitler was handed power constitutionally. The high command regarded the former corporal with disdain and was profoundly hostile to the SA. But most generals objected to the methods, street violence, rather than the declared aims of the movement. Hitler addressed the generals in February 1933. The hardest speech of my life, as he later described it. They heard him in silence, deaf to his impassioned oratory. Even so, they were hearing what they wanted to hear. Hitler's foreign policy boiled down to revenge for 1918. His domestic plans emphasized public order and a massive rearmament program. There were no objections from the generals. Hitler benefited from rearmament, but he did not start it. Because of the ban on offensive weapons like tanks, poison gas, aeroplanes and U-boats, the Reichswehr had to keep training with such weapons a secret. Thanks to a covert agreement with the Soviets, German officers had trained with the Red Army throughout the 1920s. The Allied Control Commission, which monitored compliance with the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, left Germany at the beginning of 1927. Almost immediately, the Weimar government stepped up design and testing of new weapons and the training of troops in Germany itself. The Krupp Artillery Design Department, which had been working under false company names in Holland and Sweden, returned to Germany. The company went ahead with trial manufacture of new weapons, a process known to Krupp as Schwarzer Produktion, or Black Production. Torpedoes and torpedo tubes, self-propelled artillery, submarine equipment of all kinds emerged from the design shops. The first examples of the magnificent 88mm anti-aircraft gun, originally designed by a Krupp team in Sweden, were completed. Armoured vehicle design was also well advanced. Although production examples were still several years away, most of the components which would power the Blitzkrieg had already been developed and tested. But it was not simply weapons. Krupp also invested in the plant that would be needed. A new 15,000 ton press was installed. Its only function would be to stamp out large cannon barrels. Krupp also developed a super hard tool steel which would allow a lathe to machine an artillery shell in 12 minutes. During World War I, it had taken 220 minutes. So complete was the design process that when it came to rearm, Germany could put advanced new weapons into series production with the minimum of delay. And starting from scratch meant that the armed forces were not saddled with old and obsolete designs when they went to war. Indeed, the design of every major artillery piece used by the Wehrmacht up until 1942 had been finalized by 1933. And all that was required from the Nazis was the decision to put them into production. But to make the decision, the Nazis needed to be in power. And in the early 1930s, that was not a foregone conclusion. One of the key economic supporters of Hitler was Hjalmar Schacht, the president of the Reichsbank, who backed Hitler from 1930 and was reappointed by the Nazis after 1933. He was instrumental in persuading a number of Rhineland industrialists to contribute to NSDAP election expenses. During the autumn political crisis of 1932, President Hindenburg received a petition bearing the signatures of 20 business leaders demanding he appoint Hitler as chancellor. However, there was only one prominent industrialist on it, the steel and arms baron Fritz Thiessen. The rest were middle-ranking landholders and businessmen. Even at the 11th hour of the Weimar Republic, only a minority of German industrialists and bankers supported Hitler. Although many made contributions to the Nazis, they did not then 
pour vast sums into Hitler's hands in the hope he would rule in their interest. In fact, they were simply spreading their money around for political insurance and were making much larger payments to parties on the conservative right. This accursed man will cast our Reich into the abyss and bring our nation to inconceivable misery. Future generations will damn you in your grave for what you have done. So wrote former General Erich von Ludendorff, who was former brother-in-arms President Hindenburg, after he appointed Hitler Chancellor. It was a rare outburst of sense from the man who had enjoyed virtually dictatorial powers in 1917 and 1918, and who had marched with the Nazis in the 1923 Putsch. By 1933, Ludendorff had lost all credibility, but Hindenburg had probably lost his senses. He was 86 years old and in poor health, previously adamant that he would not grant Hitler the chancellorship, certainly not without a parliamentary majority. The field marshal relented on the 30th of January, 1933. The man who badgered Hindenburg into changing his mind was arguably Hitler's greatest ally, not that he knew it. Franz von Papen was appointed chancellor in June, 1932. But in the elections that November, his coalition was exposed for what it was, a cabinet of barons. It had little popular support, and the Reichstag was dominated by parties dedicated to its destruction. Hindenburg reluctantly dismissed Papen's government on the 3rd of December, and in the following weeks, Germany's political future was decided behind closed doors. Papen made the most grotesque error of political judgment in modern history when he accepted the post of vice-chancellor in a Hitler cabinet, since he believed he and his aristocratic supporters could manipulate Adolf Hitler. If Hitler had not been given power at that moment, the Nazi movement would probably have splintered. The passions Hitler had aroused to fever pitch could not be sustained. His refusal to accept a cabinet position in 1932 led to a slump in the Nazi vote in November, with voters deserting a party that refused to take part in government. Cesare Borgia's motto, Caesar or nothing, might also have been written for Hitler. Thanks to von Papen, Hitler's all-or-nothing policy paid off. In January 1933, the Nazi leader was appointed head of the executive branch of the government, and most leading industrialists led by Gustav Krupp pledged their full support to the Führer. Whatever the complexion of the government in power, the authorities deliberately deceived the world as to the scope and extent of German rearmament. During the period of covert expansion under the Weimar government and in the first two years of Nazi rule, the Germans lied to cover the truth about what they were doing. They made themselves seem whiter than white to the international community. They concealed weapons and disguised military aircraft as civilian models. They reformed the general staff, forbidden by the Versailles Treaty, under the innocuous name of Truppenamt, or Troop Office. They trained more officers and men than they needed by means of short-term enlistments and employed at least twice as many officers than they were permitted to by treaty as civilian contractors in the Ministry of Defence or in the police and other paramilitary organisations. They practised manoeuvres with obviously dummy weapons, tanks made of canvas with rubber guns. They lied about the tonnage of warships being built. The pocket battleships laid down in the late 1920s and the heavy cruisers of the 1930s were nominally within the 10,000 ton limit fixed by international agreements. In reality, they were 50% heavier. They set up overseas companies to research into forbidden military technologies such as gas, aircraft and submarines. The lying continued when rearmament emerged into the open in 1935. Now, however, the intent was to persuade the rest of the world that the Wehrmacht was stronger than it really was. The Nazis exaggerated the number of troops under arms and built phony support facilities to bolster the deception. They exaggerated the number of aircraft in service and omitted to mention that many of those seen in massed formations over Berlin were unarmed. Above all, 
they mounted an intense and highly effective propaganda campaign, using the vast crowds at the party rallies to give the impression of a fully regimented nation obedient to the will of one man, Adolf Hitler. There was a reason for this exaggeration above and beyond Hitler's glorification. The Führer made no secret of the fact that he wanted to restore lost Germanic lands to the Reich. And he reasoned that the way to do that without interference was to persuade the other powers that Germany was much stronger than it actually was. During the occupation of the Rhineland in March 1936, the Wehrmacht was instructed to retreat at the first sign of French opposition. This was because the French could call on at least 30 divisions in the border areas, while Germany, then in the process of tripling its army, had only one operational division that could only spare three battalions, about 3,000 men, for the march into the demilitarized zone. It was a desperate gamble, but it paid off. The Reich propaganda machine's deliberate exaggeration had found willing listeners in London and Paris. British intelligence reported that the Germans had used four full divisions, about 35,000 men, in the Rhineland operation. The French believed that Hitler had thrown a quarter of a million men into the occupation. Similar overstatements followed the German Union with Austria, the occupation of the Sudetenland, and the annexation of Bohemia and Moravia. Part of the reason that reality did not match the propaganda image was that rearmament posed serious economic problems for Germany. This was due to her heavy reliance upon the import of food and raw materials. Once the slack in the economy had been taken up, continued emphasis on rearmament led inexorably to a balance of payment crisis. Significantly, Hitler refused to tolerate any substantial fall in living standards for the sake of rearming. Dictatorships, more so than democratically elected leaders, are very sensitive to public opinion, or what their secret police imagine such opinion to be. Hitler wanted life to be as good as possible for the ordinary German, for the farmers in the fields and the children in the kindergartens. Any strain on the economy might bring inflation, and inflation would raise the spectre of the depression so recently passed. He also instinctively feared that long-term investment in the arms industry and the general disruption of the peacetime economy would endanger his personal rule by placing too much power in the hands of the industrialists. His solution was to rearm selectively, by restricting war production to a limited sector of the economy, by manufacturing only those arms which could be used immediately and to good effect, it was possible to have guns and butter. No undue strain was placed on the people, while Hitler was able to build up a sizable army in the shortest possible time. Only in 1935 did arms expenditure rise noticeably. When it did so, it was raised fivefold, but this was from a very low baseline. Spending doubled in 1936. Surprisingly, in 1937, the military budget dropped slightly to a level no more than 5% of German gross domestic product. The general staff approved of this type of rearmament. If it came to war, a corps of powerful armored units with a small army of motorized infantry trained in blitzkrieg tactics could strike quickly and win decisive battles in a matter of days. Provided, of course, that Hitler could isolate the victim. These kinds of forces were only suitable for a short victorious war. If Britain, France or Russia became involved, then Germany would be plunged into a long war, which most of the generals felt she could not possibly win. At least, not for the moment. Hitler had inherited a very modest naval force when he came to power in 1933. With the bulk of the once-feared high seas fleet at the bottom of Scarpa Flow, where it had been scuttled in a final act of defiance in 1919, the most powerful warships left to post-war Germany were eight pre-dreadnought battleships, already obsolete by 1914. U-boats, which had inflicted such terrible losses on British merchant shipping during World War I, were forbidden altogether. The Navy continued to develop submarine designs in secret, funding the construction of six new boats in Finland and one later in Spain. This clandestine program was exposed by the German press in 1926 
leading to the resignations of the then Minister of Defence and the commander of the Reichsmarine. However, the political climate changed and the German Navy was already poised to break the Versailles Treaty before Hitler became Chancellor in January 1933. A construction programme authorised in 1932 envisaged six armoured ships, an aircraft carrier, six new heavy cruisers and 16 submarines. Hitler had a boyish fascination with the minutiae of naval construction and took a personal interest in the building plans advanced by the Kriegsmarine. However, his exceptional memory, especially for technical data, masked his very uneven grasp of technological issues and an even more limited mastery of maritime strategy. Determined on a rapid expansion of the Navy, he sought a formal agreement with Britain rather than risk immediate confrontation. The result was the 1935 Anglo-German Naval Agreement, under which Germany was allowed to build modern capital ships up to a ceiling of 35% of the Royal Navy's battleship tonnage. Incredibly, given the damage they had done 20 years earlier, the British agreed that Germany could expand its submarine fleet to achieve parity with that of the Royal Navy. The German air service in World War I was a formidable force, aggressively led with well-designed machines. Airships and long-range bombers like the Gotha had launched the first strategic attacks against the cities of Paris and London. Following the 1918 armistice, the service was disbanded and the aircraft dismantled and destroyed. As with all other air forces of the time, it had been part of the army and it was not until the Nazis came to power that it became the Luftwaffe, a separate arm. The interwar period saw air power theorists and enthusiasts promote the effectiveness of bombers and fighters in an atmosphere which made aircraft both glamorous and omnipotent. Although the Luftwaffe was not formally established until March 1935, Germany had managed to develop medium-range bombers and transports and train pilots from as early as 1926. Key to early developments was the state airline Deutsche Lufthansa. Headed by World War I veteran Erhard Milch, the civil airline operated the versatile Junkers Ju-52, as well as sleek Heinkel airliners that were thinly disguised bombers. To provide pilots for the new airline, the Weimar government sponsored the German Union of Sport Flying. By the early 1930s, it had 50,000 members. The organization gave boys and young men the chance to fly gliders and light aircraft, and therefore provided an excellent pool of experienced or semi-trained pilots. Although plans for the new German Air Force had been made under the Weimar Republic, it was the Nazis who eventually threw off the shackles of the Versailles Treaty. World War I fighter ace Hermann Göring was Minister of Aviation in the new regime. At that time, second only to Hitler and the Nazi hierarchy, Göring was well placed to further the new arm of service. A clandestine organization was set up in 1933, and with full German rearmament in 1935, the Luftwaffe came into the open. In 1936, the Luftwaffe lost its first chief of staff in an air accident. General Walter Weber was an advocate of long-range strategic bombers which would allow Germany to attack industrial targets deep inside enemy territory. With his death, this critical weapon was neglected as aircraft designers and manufacturers concentrated on medium bombers and dive bombers suitable for close support operations with the army. By the time Germany sent military support to Franco in the Spanish Civil War, the Luftwaffe was well established. The Civil War was a valuable proving ground for new aircraft designs and also gave the pilots in the Condor region the opportunity to test tactics and polish combat flying skills. The Heinkel HE-111, Dornier DO-17, Junkers Ju-52, Ju-86 and Ju-87 and the Messerschmitt Bf-109 and Bf-110 were flown in action in Spain by pilots who were rotating through the war zone. The Condor Legion demonstrated the effectiveness of air power when in July 1936, shuttles of Ju-52s flew 7,350 nationalist troops with their artillery and equipment from Morocco to Spain.
when the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe exploded onto the world stage in September 1939, it seemed that the Nazis had worked a miracle. It had only been four years since Hitler had publicly thrown off the shackles imposed at Versailles. Few knew of the rearmament planning which had started almost as soon as the guns fell silent in 1918. Fewer still knew of the research and development programs undertaken by the German army and by German industry. The rest of the world, duped by Goebbels' propaganda ministry, believed that the Wehrmacht had miraculously emerged overnight as a fully-fledged and irresistible fighting machine. In the first two years of war, illusion and reality merged, as Poland, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, and much of European Russia were crushed under the jackboot. By the end of 1941, the early years of promise had been soured as the Wehrmacht suffered its first reverses. The force had been designed for quick and easy triumphs. It fell victim to its own success. Hitler thought that nothing could withstand his warriors of the lightning war and so fatally overreached himself. From Russia through North Africa and from Normandy to the borders of the Rhine, the German army became locked into a grim and hopeless struggle for survival, a struggle it could not win. <laughs>